Hey, this is Mr. Masonette, and in this tutorial, we are going to review the concept of volume as a three-dimensional measure. But before we dive into volume, let's review one- and two-dimensional measures first, which will allow us to understand volume in more depth. Now, something one-dimensional is measured in linear units, and two-dimensional objects are measured in square units. And of course, something that has three dimensions is measured in cubic units. Now, it is important to remember that linear, square, and cubic measures are measures in the one, two, and three dimensions respectively. And as such, they are labeled differently. Linear units, whether it be centimeters, meters, or any other type of unit, does not have an exponent written at the end of the unit. Even though we don't write one, we should understand that the exponent is to the first power, which represents one dimension. So, the line on the screen is four linear centimeters in length, which is one dimensional. With two dimensional objects, we label the units with an exponent of two, which represents two dimensions or square units. And with three dimensional objects, we label the units being used to measure the object with an exponent of three, which represents three dimensions or cubic units. So, an example of something that is one-dimensional is something that can only be measured in one direction or a straight line. Examples of one-dimensional measures may be the height of a person, uh, the distance of one city to another city, or anything that can be measured in a straight line. Now, there are objects that are not shown in a straight line, but are still one-dimensional because you could straighten those objects out and put them in a straight line and measure them against a ruler. Now, perimeter is another example of a one-dimensional measure. Even though we see a two-dimensional shape, we are only measuring the distance of the line which forms the polygon. Now, area is an example of a two-dimensional measure. Area measures how many square units it takes to cover the flat plane of a surface. Some examples of things that can be measured with this two-dimensional measure are things like the surface of a lake, the surface of a classroom floor, or maybe even the surface of a wall. Now, on to volume. Volume is a three-dimensional measure. Volume measures how much space an object occupies. We use cubic units to measure how much space is being occupied. We can think about volume like filling up an object or occupying a certain amount of space. Examples of volume may be the volume of a swimming pool, the volume of a person's lungs, or maybe even the volume of a gasoline tank, or anything that can be filled up. So, we can build two-dimensional figures from lines which are one-dimensional, and we can build three-dimensional figures from two-dimensional objects or flat surfaces. So, right here we have a one-dimensional line. If we add more lines, we can form the boundaries of a two-dimensional object. In this example, we have a four by five rectangle which takes up an area of 20 square centimeters. Now, let's take that 20 square centimeter rectangle and add one more dimension to it. If we add depth or height to the rectangle, we are adding a third dimension, turning the rectangle into a rectangular prism. Now, if we take the area of the rectangle before we give it height, which is 20 square units, and multiply the area by the height, it will result in the prism's volume. When the height is one, it's like saying we have one stack of 20 cubes. If we extend the height to be two centimeters, it's like saying we have two stacks of 20 for a volume of 40 cubic centimeters. Now, let's make that three stacks of 20 cubes, and now we have 60 cubic centimeters. Four stacks is 80 cubic centimeters. A fifth stack is 100 cubic centimeters, and six stacks of 20 is 120 square centimeters. Now, it's probably drilled into your head that the volume of a rectangular prism is found by multiplying its length times its width by its height, which is true. But I want you to consider the first part of that equation, which is length times width. Length times width gave us the area of the rectangle's base before we gave it a third dimension. So, we can summarize the formula as the area of the object's base multiplied by the object's height. And the reason why it is important to see things from this perspective is because this works for the volume of all prisms. Length times width times height is only specific to find the volume of rectangular prisms, 
it will not work for other prisms. However, finding the area of a prism's base and multiplying by its height will work for any kind of prism and also cylinders which technically are not prisms. For example, let's take our rectangular prism and cut it in half along a diagonal to create a triangular prism. Now, just like any type of prism, to find its volume, you can find the area of its base, which in this case is a triangle, and then multiply that area by the prism's height. So, the triangle shown has a base of 4 and a height of 5. To find the area of any triangle, multiply the base times the height and divide by 2. So, the triangular base has an area of 10 square units in this case, and multiplying this area by the prism's height of 6 gives us a volume of 60 cubic centimeters. Notice that the volume of this triangular prism is exactly half of what the rectangular prism was, which had a volume of 120 cubic centimeters. Now, taking a look at the objects on the screen, we should notice that the top and the bottom surfaces are congruent to each other. With objects such as these, we can always find the volume of any of them by finding the area of that object's base and then multiplying by that object's height. Five out of the six objects shown are different types of prisms. Technically, the cylinder is not a prism, but its volume can be calculated in the same way. You would find the area of the circular base and multiply that result by the cylinder's height. A generalized formula to find the volume of any of these objects is volume equals capital B times H. Now, capital B represents the area of that object's base which is then multiplied by the height of that object. So as long as you know how to find the area of the object's base, then you can find the volume of that object. I want to say thanks for checking out this math video. Please don't forget to smash that subscribe button and follow me at the social media links listed on the screen. Until next time, this is Mr. Masonette for Masonette Math.